it, it seems to me that although the, the question of ethnic federalism and the accommodation of diversity is particularly acute in Ethiopia, this is a question that every political society faces, the question of e pluribus unum, mm -hmm. right? How do you create a, a communal polity out of various types of diversity? Um, you rightly, I think, bring up the complicating factor of post-colonialism in Africa, although Ethiopia was never colonized. And mm -hmm. so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the, uh, the historical precursors. What was the state formation in Ethiopia even before European colonialism? And, and maybe whether there's any, uh, any models that might provide some solutions to the present crisis. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as you said, uh, Ethiopia was not colonized by any European power, I think. Uh, that's why some, so sometimes we, we argue that uh, since Ethiopia was independent for a long time, we don't have to really uh, follow like Western or Eastern model and try to focus on our indigenous uh, uh, state formation like some other countries have done, like Japan and others. Some, some argue, like Haile Selassie, for instance, when he adopted the first constitution, he said it's an indigenous monarchy, so it should be based on our values and cultures. So uh, that would have been the, the solution for that. And uh, when you see the history of uh, Ethiopia, I think, uh, as you know, uh, you know Ethiopia from uh, the Old Testament to uh, even the, the New Testament and historically Ethiopia has been uh, very, very prominent. But when you see uh, how Ethiopia as a state existed, particularly the Aksum uh, Kingdom, mm. it was very uh, prominent kingdom uh, uh, until the seventh century. And this was the most important uh, strong uh, uh, civilization we had. Still now, uh, there is an evidence about this prominent civilization as it's expressed in the obeliscus you find in Aksum. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the, the Solomonic dynasty, which is, uh, of course, uh, mainly this monarchy from the uh, Haile Selassie and all uh, his predecessors, they claim to be uh, like inheriting the Solomonic uh, dynasty, which is related to the uh, Israel and uh, King Solomon, all this. Mm -hmm. so, uh, our um, uh, cultural history is very rich because it traces to uh, Israel, uh, King David, and all the testament, all this. Uh, but I think uh, the most important, uh, really, for the formation of modern Ethiopia is the time of Imperial Minilik. Uh, in, in, in before, like uh, uh, maybe the, the, the Battle of Adwa, the Battle of Adwa, where there was a battle between Ethiopia and uh, uh, Italy because after the scramble for Africa, Italy wanted to colonize uh, Ethiopia. So, but it, it lost the war in, in 1896 as the Battle of Adwa. This was the first uh, time where European colonial powers lost uh, really a war to an African indigenous uh, uh, army. So af I think after uh, the Battle of Adwa, Minilik started to consolidate uh, the country, and he expanded the territory to the south. That means incorporating the ethnic groups that now demand for uh, more autonomy. They say the expansion of Emperor Minilik was colonization. They call it, it is internal colonialism. The scramble for Ethiopia. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's like the scramble for Ethiopia. So then Haile Selassie continued the consolidation of the monarchy. So he was trying to formulate uh, Ethiopia in the form of nation state, like because during the Ita Italian occupation of Ethiopia in 1936 to 41, uh, Haile Selassie was uh, in uh, England for five years. So he had the opportunity to observe and learn about how the European <laughs> government was working immediately after uh, Ethiopia became independent in 1941, he started to really uh, form the nation state. Yeah. So more or less during that time, the rights of these minority groups was not really accommodated. So that was, I think, the failure. 
how you should go about to address those minority groups. Yeah, I don't know if England or Japan are really the best models for accommodation of ethnic difference. But when you talk about the consolidation of Ethiopia and mm. of Ethiopian identity, I mean, you yourself mentioned it was a kind of domestic colonization. Um, when we talk about... At least about other, uh, that's what the ethnic-based groups, they claim that that's colonialism. But right, so what do we mean by Ethiopian identity? I mean, if it's not subsuming other ethnic groups, was there ever really an accommodation <laughs> or, or recognition of political I and I cultural autonomy? I think uh, when we see Ethiopia, um, as you say, that's also one of the contested concepts, who is an Ethiopian, because uh, the students' movement that started in 1975, uh, 74, they said that, who is an Ethiopian? Whose culture is, is Ethiopian? So that was uh, the, 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 the factor. But I think in every society, there is a dominant culture. Mm -hmm. The dominant culture would try to assimilate other groups and any state formation in any part of the world, uh, they, they did the same thing. Like the United States, like the, right, uh, the, the, the slaves, or the rights of the black people, or the rights of women. It was after uh, reforming the state that the rights of these groups have been accommodated. In Ethiopia also, I think, even if there was a dominant culture, like speaking Amharic, mm -hmm. Orthodox Christian, and uh, like a uh, specific way of life from the north part of the country was the dominant culture. I think when you see the Haile Selassie time, if you are from even if any ethnic group, uh, as far as you are willing to accept that dominant culture, you can integrate. It's not like based on like Amhara or some ethnic groups should be dominant and others should not like or South Africa or apartheid system. Anyone who accept or who, is, who, ha, who got favor in the face of the king or the emperor, you can't be just any, anyone. So that's all. So I think the problem with the way the students' movement and later on the, this constitution uh, tries to do is it completely, uh, 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 completely destroyed the social fabric we had. Rather than building up from the foundations, like the reforms that, that has been taking place in the United States or elsewhere, it just uh, completely destroyed it and said that, oh, let's form a new state. Let's have different ethnic groups. Let's discuss and let's have a constitution. Now, just we leave all the history and background we have and let's mm -hmm. start as a new country. So I think that's the problem. It's not, the problem is not really accommodating uh, linguistic or cultural groups. The problem of the Ethiopian constitutional system is that it is uh, like uh, destroying the country and starting all over again. Mm -hmm. So that's why the problem is, I think, happening. Because now, what is the most important, um, really, priority for Ethiopia? Like a country which is very poor, weak, is it maintaining national unity and continue to exist as a state, or end up in civil war and conflict in the name of accommodating ethnic and cultural diversity? Mm -hmm. So for me, First, let's have national unity, let us exist as a state, and gradually let's have a ways of reforming the institutions. That's why I don't accept this constitutional arrangement, because uh, like Yugoslavia and Soviet Union, at the end of the day, I think will end up with disintegration. Yeah, I mean the student movement, and certainly the 91 constitution made things worse, but was there really a social fabric to build from whether uh, during Haile Selassie's time or some yeah. historical precedent from Aksum or, or Gondor. Or I'm, I'm just, yeah. I just wonder if there's a, a theoretical impossibility to federalism to begin with. Because the idea of dual sovereignty theoretically shouldn't work. And it seems like when you've got ethnically diverse um, polities, they ultimately are held together by a kind of colonial authority or um, mm. some yes. type of authoritarian figure like Tito held yes. together the yeah. diversity in Yugoslavia yes. for a while or Haile Selassie mm. Um, mm. or it reverts to a kind of balkanization. So so was is there a, sol a historical solution that you can build from? Yeah, that's a very good point that uh, you said. Uh, like for instance in Ethiopia, uh, the late Mela Zenawi uh, who was leading Ethiopia from in 1992 to 2012, mm -hmm. he was a strong man, like Tito. 
So he was in control of the system. And f during all the time he was in power, it looks like it was working, it was peaceful, and there was no conflict. But once he's gone, all the, the differences and uh, the conflict started. So I think in my, the, in my uh, uh, argument, and also I have done a research on this, I think the best way is let's just accept that even if the state was like <laughs> the United States or European state was formed like crushing, assimilating groups, mm. I think we shouldn't go and just undone everything that has been done. Like the country was uh, formed, there was an, an expansion and one dominant culture and language was really uh, the, 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 the dominant one in, in, in for, for many years. But let, for, for instance, there is the Haile Selassie system, let's say the Haile Selassie system. Whether you are an Oromo, I think most of the Haile Selassie uh, generals were from the Oromo ethnic mm -hmm. group uh, or from the Tigra ethnic group during the Gondor civilization. Right. There were prominent Oromo royalists who have been dominated in Gondor. So in, rather than trying to find commonalities where we had the ch a very uh, integrated history, the student movement said that Ethiopia is a prison of nationality, like right. Stalin said for Russia. They said that they should be liberated because it was one culture, Samhara culture. and uh, So first of all, they say, let's be independent, and then we'll agree to come together. So I think there, is a, there was a foundation where we can make reforms, like for instance, one of the reforms you could have undertook is to recognize the language groups, like in education, in government. Mm -hmm. We could do it without really disintegrating the country. We could empower uh, minority groups without uh, demarcating uh, the regions according to ethnic line. Like, like, like for instance, Switzerland, you have cantons, like most of these cantons are German cantons, but all the Germans, they don't demand to be under one German canton. Mm -hmm. Why should we just have like, in Ethiopia, the, the way that they say one ethnic group should have one state. So where will be that end? Now, the 56 ethnic groups in the southern uh, nation and national region in Ethiopia, they are demanding self-autonomy. So if, according to the constitution, they are granted with these uh, uh, rights, we will have almost 60 status within a few years. Okay. And yes. then there's the problem of balkanization where like, you get southern Ossetia separating from the Ossetia. From that so one, yeah. Even from Oromia yeah. and Amhara, there are some groups now that Amhara, for instance, the Amhara region is dominant one. Amharic is, or is the dominant language, the culture is Amhara, but there are minority groups, the Ago, the Oromo. They are demanding even state now. Yeah. That's why this uh, formula and uh, the solution, the student movement, and later on this constitution brought about is really just disastrous. Mm -hmm. It will not work. It seems to me, given the cases of, especially Yugoslavia and Rwanda and other cases of ethnic conflict, there's really two narratives you can follow. And, and one narrative, which was the prominent narrative for both uh, Yugoslavia and Rwanda, was is that um, there's these ancient ethnic differences and hatreds and they have to be kept, the, you have to keep the, the lid on the pot and you need a strong authoritarian figure like a Tito to hold it together. Once that uh, figure is gone, then ethnic difference just explodes. Um, the other narrative though is that um, people can manage ethnic differences on their own and that these differences are exploited for political gain during periods of crisis and an absence of authority or vacuum of authority. Could you talk a little bit about how that dynamic is working in Ethiopia now? It's, it seemed to me when I was in, I mean, I know Addis is a bit of a bubble, but when I was there, there seemed to be a lot of um, support for a kind of common Ethiopian identity, recognizing and respecting ethnic difference. Mm -hmm. And yet there's political leaders like Joar Muhammad who yeah. are, who are yeah. promoting ethnic division, it seems to me, for political gain. So oh could yeah. you talk about how that's working now? That's a very good, um, uh, I think that's how we, we can see it. Uh, for instance, when you see the Ethiopian case and also Yugoslavia and others, and even including Uganda, when um, ethnic diversity has been uh, institutionalized or used to divide uh, nations and countries, mm -hmm. I think 
those countries, particularly if those countries are like in Africa or there is no democracy or well-advanced economic systems, these uh, societies could only exist when there is a strong man. Because already there is a politicized ethnic identity and uh, there are so many demands and conflicts, tensions, differences between these groups. There will not be any institutional mechanism once you have really uh, divided the people, there will not be any institutional mechanism to really uh, bring these people together. I don't think that that works. So once uh, it's politicized, once the, can the country uh, politically divided according to li ethnic lines, it needs a strong man. Mm -hmm. But if like it was like traditional Ethiopia or pre-colonial Ethiopia or Africa where uh, these societies or the traditional groups were expressing their culture or language not for any political gain. Mm -hmm. If that was the situation, you can find a solution. Okay, there are different groups who have different culture, different ethnic groups, so how can we live together? They could find ways to address. Like in Ethiopia, for instance, uh, my grand uh, mom, or she was living in an Oromo region where they don't speak Amharic. So she had to learn to go to shopping and market to speak the, uh, the Oromo language mm -hmm. because she will be forced to do that because the people they don't understand her, her language. So the, the, the society would find ways to live together. First, once you are politicized, it, you said, oh, you are Amhara, uh, you, are, um, uh, you are Oromo, then there is a division. So you said, oh, you have been uh, oppressing me, you have been uh, really destroyed, you have destroyed my culture and institutions, you killed my people how can we find ways to live together? Mm -hmm. So I think that's the difference. Once it is politicized, it will be much difficult. But in societies where ethnic and like, cultural difference has not been really antagonized and used for political purposes, uh, still it is very, very uh, possible to find uh, really political solutions for, to, for those societies. Mm -hmm. That's how I see the differences. That's why if, for instance, Haile Selassie was not too late uh, particularly because he was eight years old, he was very old, and uh, different uh, advisors, including his prime minister, was uh, asking him to recognize some autonomy and to modernize the government. He, he rejected it. If he had done that one, mm -hmm. with he could have averted the revolution, and uh, the letter of the civil war would have been averted, and the Ethiopian state formation could be more stable. It will not have been like destructive as it has been now. Mm -hmm. That's why, uh, really, that's how I, I see the different ways that we could have. Um, I was just wondering um, uh, about the model of the European Union and whether there's any lessons there, because from a certain perspective, that was a economic and political solution to hundreds of years of ethnic warfare and division in Europe that recognizes different cultures, but on a uh, a higher political and economic level they can manage it. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the European Union, uh, the problem is that members of the European Union are nation states. So if you try to use it for like the Ethiopian model, you are uh, maybe first you say, oh, let's have like our own nation state and uh, we have like confederation to live together. So. Thi these ethnic groups are in a very, very primitive level because their economic development, uh, their boundaries contested and everything, so you don't have, you couldn't have a nation state in that kind of country. So mm. even the European could be a model for like Africa, where these disintegrated and uh, disconnected African countries could use the European model mm. to bring about economic development. But for, I think, African specific African countries where there is uh, ethnic conflict, is even the European model could be more uh, kind of uh, 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 empowering, like yeah. more ethnic <laughs> demands. So they have to I go through 500 <laughs> years of warfare <laughs> before the yeah. before you have the nation state. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, my last question is: What's what's your happy ending? Well, I think my uh, my hope is that um, I think there are some also some some really uh, even for from uh, uh, some ethnic based political leaders. They say. Uh, the country need uh, political consensus and reconciliation. At least they, uh, they should uh, recognize the fact that this tension cannot continue like this. And even we can't resolve these conflicts and tensions by elections. So my hope is that the elites and political groups in the country would understand the dangerous situation that we are in and try to 
uh, negotiate and uh, have uh, some political debate and find out solutions to balance the interests of the, the various groups. The, uh, one, the ethnic-based groups, as well as those who, who are really promoting for national unity. Otherwise, I think uh, it, it will not be really uh, very, very, uh, we, will, we will not have a good prospect in the future. Mm. Yeah. Well, the creation of a multi-ethnic political party is a good step, good first step, and we'll see how the elections go. Yes, going like uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has uh, eliminated the kind of ethnic-based coalition. Now he has formed a unified party, uh, which uh, irrespective of your ethnic background, you can be a member of that political group. The problem is, after he started uh, doing this unification party, the ethnic political parties, they are forming a big coalition to oust him. Because they say he's a unitary. So he's going to reverse this ethnic political uh, system. So they are now uh, uh, kind of mobilizing their power. He's so clever, he <laughs> got them working <laughs> together, finally. Yes, I think so. Yeah. In, in one way, he forced them to work together. Because we had over 70 parties, political parties disintegrated so yeah because to challenge him they have to work together Good yeah. well <laughs> best wishes <laughs>